Hey, how's it going? Um, we are going to be looking at some of the background information that we need to know and understand a little bit as we move forward with some of our literary pieces that we're going to be reading this year. Uh, the next big piece that we're reading is called The Odyssey. But for us to more fully understand The Odyssey as we start to read through it in the next couple of weeks here leading up through the end of the semester, we want to have, like I said, a basic idea of some of the background behind it and, and why the stuff in the Odyssey takes place. Um, real briefly, the Odyssey is a story about um, a guy by the name of Odysseus and his journey. That's why we call things an Odyssey if you go on like a long journey. His journey back from a war that he went to fight um, as a fairly young man and then on his uh, journey back home to where he came from. Uh, and that's called the Odyssey. And that's what we're going to be really looking at in terms of literature. Um, like I said, kind of up through the end of the semester, um, which is rapidly approaching. But to more fully understand that, um, because it's kind of an old Greek, what we call an epic poem, we want to understand the background behind those types of literature, the epic poem, and then also the story of Odysseus and why he was away from home to start. Like, what was this war that he was out starting to fight? So today, we're going to look at um, what we call the Trojan War. And we're going to study that a little bit to kind of get a background um, of the Trojan War and what happened there. You might be familiar with the Trojan War a little bit. Uh, there have been some famous movies out about it and things like that. Um, and also these old Greek epic poems, they use a lot of Greek mythology. Um, so gods and goddesses and certain powers that the gods and goddesses have and what they're the gods and goddesses of. Um, because through the Odyssey, Odysseus, on his journey, runs into a lot of the gods and goddesses. And some look favorably upon him and help him out, and others don't. They look unfavorably, unfavorably upon him and don't help him out. So, like I said, today we're going to be looking at um, some of the background information, is uh, specifically uh, the Battle of Troy, or the Trojan War. And so um, what I want you to do here as we go through, you're going to follow along on this slideshow with me. As we look at some of the, let me get this thing opened here. As we look at, like I said, some of the stuff with the Odyssey. All right, so the introduction of the Odyssey. And I don't know if, like, this slide's perfect. It starts right out with one of the, the Greek gods and goddesses. And if anybody can take a guess at who this is, this is Poseidon. Um, he's one of the gods, and specifically the gods of, like, the ocean or the sea. Um, he's got his trident with him. That's what we call this thing here. Have any of you seen, like, um, oh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. How about um, Disney's The Little Mermaid? Like, I think the dad, doesn't he come around, like, he holds a trident, and he lives in the ocean and, and in the sea. Um, they base that, some of that character off of this guy here, Poseidon. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. Uh, 3,000 years ago. Okay, we're talking about 3,000 years ago. That's a long time ago. In Greece, um, back then, there's like storytelling tradition. Um, stories were passed down. I gotta move my. By telling them rather than writing them. So oftentimes, it was actually the job of people. Like people had that job in a sense they would they would move around from town to town telling stories so people would gather in city streets and in town streets uh, to listen to these kind of actors in a sense tell these stories so there's a lot more um, spoken tradition back then as opposed to written tradition hundreds of stories were memorized and passed down from generation to generation we still have that today where you have stories that are passed from generation to generation about maybe certain things that happen in your family but this was a, a huge piece of society back in greece 3000 years ago the teller of stories so this is a guy by the name of homer 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 too old of two great war stories in Greek, the Iliad and the Odyssey. 
These are two stories that he wrote or told that are very, very famous today. And they kind of go hand in hand. The Iliad actually happens first and then the Odyssey happens after that. Uh, they're kind of, the Odyssey is more or less a, like a sequel to the Iliad. We're not reading the Iliad. In fact, we're not even going to read the whole Odyssey. That would take us a long time. We're just going to read bits and pieces of it um, about Odysseus's journey back through. But maybe you've heard of the Iliad as well. Uh, the Iliad was a story about a 10-year war that destroyed the city of Troy. And so instead of reading the whole Iliad, we're going to take like today <laughs> to kind of condense that down and discuss a little bit about um, that city of Troy in the, the Trojan War is what we then call it. So what happened here? Uh, history would tell us if people believe that this actually happened or not. Helen, who was considered the most beautiful woman in the world, left her husband and Greek king Menelaus to run off with Paris, who was a prince of Troy. What you need to understand, back then in, in ancient Greece, there were all sorts of what we call city-states. Um, so they kind of operated all as their own like nations, but huge cities, but they called them city-states. And they were all fairly friendly with each other. And they all had a king. They were all kind of monarchs. And usually, because they were all fairly friendly with each other, they kind of backed each other up. Well, again, so like it says here, one of those kings, his name was King Menelaus, and he had the wife named Helen. And she was, like it says here, considered the most beautiful woman in the world. She ends up leaving her husband and runs off with this handsome young prince named Paris, and he's the prince of Troy. And so they, they leave, and they run off to Troy. So obviously Menelaus isn't happy. He's angry, Menelaus. Uh, that his woman left him, and so he rounds up some men to begin a war between Sparta, which is kind of where he's from, in Greece, and Troy. Uh, his army are old admirers, they're, they're suitors of Helen, suitors meaning uh, people that were kind of after her hand in marriage before she was married to Menelaus, um, and they all swore to defend anyone who ends up with her. So she ended up with Menelaus originally, and so when he is uh, mad that she leaves him, they all, all the other kings in the Greek city-states, or many of them, come to his backing and want to support him. So the war wages the Spartans. So that's Menelaus's crew Spartans. If, if you notice, a lot of actually these these nicknames and names um, have relevance today uh, in terms of shoot. Think about the Spartans, Michigan State University, right? They're the Spartans. I'll keep bringing those up as as we run into to some of these. I already mentioned the word Odyssey for. Odysseus and in, in the, the story we're going to read called the Odyssey. Well, that's something we use today. Like if you go on a, like a big journey, so we'll call it an Odyssey. So the Spartans, they destroy allies and everything around Troy. So they, they, they travel across to Troy. They send a massive army uh, in thousands of boats and thousands and thousands of men. They all gather together and create this huge army. Um, and they get over to Troy and they destroy, like it says here, everything around the city. But they can't get through the, the walls around the city of Troy. So what do they do? They got to come up with, with some sort of plan. And so they build this big, huge, massive uh, wooden horse. So oftentimes you hear about, and maybe you've heard about the, the Trojan horse. So they offer, notice that's in quotation marks, the horse as a peace offering. By then, everyone was tired of the war. It had been going on for 10 years. It's a long, long time. Um, the fighting was kind of at a standstill like this. Um, they did, destroyed everything outside of the city, yet they couldn't get into the city of Troy. And so they acted like they were giving up and that their battle was done. So they offer this this horse, this massive wooden horse, um, as a sign of peace to the Trojan people, or the people of Troy. Um, so the horse gets through the gates while the Spartan soldiers are hiding inside. They, they hide a bunch of troops inside of this horse, and they send the, the horse in. Uh, the Trojans then celebrate the end of the war. 
by partying it up and drinking and um, having this huge, huge, huge party. Which was then a bad idea, because while everyone was asleep, the Greeks sneak out of the Trojan horse, and they just pillage the city. They they open the gates to let more troops in. They destroy every they destroy everything that's in there, um, and defeating the Trojans. Here's a very famous picture of the the city of Troy burning. Too bad for Helen and Paris. It's said that because of Helen's beauty, uh, Menelaus, remember the king Menelaus, who was previously married to Helen, uh, decided not to kill his cheating wife. Instead, he let her live. All right. I'm going to exit out of here just for a second. And we are going to look at... A quick clip here. Even the most famous account, Homer's Iliad. Everyone knows how the Trojan War ended, with a bunch of guys piling out of a giant wooden horse. Even the most famous account, Homer's Iliad, only covers the tail end of the war. Regardless, the events of the war itself have been debated extensively, and the actual truth is still largely unknown. All we have to go on is myth. Legend states that a human king and a sea nymph were married with all the gods in attendance. However, Eris, the goddess of discord, was turned away at the door. Irritated, she tossed out her wedding gift, a golden apple to be gifted to the fairest. This title now being up for grabs, Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite squabbled over it, each laying claim to the apple. Not being able to choose amongst themselves, the goddesses decided to ask an impartial third party, a Trojan prince named Paris. Of course, all of them attempted to bribe Paris, and in the end, he chose Aphrodite, who promised him the love of Helen of Sparta, the most beautiful woman in the world. Paris, aiming to get what he was promised, stole Helen away from Sparta. What followed was a web of alliances that would make World War I blush. These allies included such all-stars as Odysseus, Agamemnon, Ajax, and Achilles. The conflict lasted a full decade, with Troy being placed under siege for the last nine years. Odysseus, who just wanted to go home to his wife Penelope, decided to finally end it once and for all using only his wits and a giant wooden horse. All right, so a little background over the Trojan War. Hey, read through this with me. The story of the Trojan War, the Bronze Age conflict between the kingdoms of Troy and Mycenaean Greece straddles the history and mythology of ancient Greece and inspired the greatest writers of antiquity, which is what, uh, a fancy word for ancient Greece, from Homer, Herodotus, and Sophocles to Virgil. So maybe you've heard some of them. Um, this story that we're going to read called The Odyssey was written by Homer. Since the 19th century rediscovery of the site of Troy in what is now known as Western Turkey, Archaeologists have uncovered increasing evidence of a kingdom that peaked and may have been destroyed around 1180 BC, perhaps forming the basis for the tales recounted by Homer some 400 years later in the Iliad and the Odyssey. So there is some historical context here, and the fact that they have started to find like artifacts of a possible city right where... Um, the city of Troy may have been, according to these epic poems written by Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, historians or many historians are thinking that they don't know if the Trojan War actually happened the way that Homer tells it, but there was possibly um, the city of Troy there, and some of these events may have taken place. So the narrative of the Trojan War. According to classical sources, the war began after the abduction or kidnapping um, of Queen Helen. They call it a kidnapping, although many people think uh, through the story that's told that she left on purpose. Um, the, the Queen of Sparta by the Trojan Prince Paris. Helen's jilted husband, Menelaus, convinced his brother Agamemnon, another one of the kings in, in ancient Greece, King of Mycenae, to lead an expedition to retrieve her. 
Agamemnon was joined by the Greek heroes Achilles, Odysseus, Nestor, and Ajax. Now, if you think about Achilles, the, the part of your body, like I said, a lot of these things carry over to today's society. And we've talked about the Spartans, so Michigan State Spartans, like big macho fighting type of guys, which is what the Spartans were like in this story. Um, Achilles, your Achilles tendon is that kind of back of your of your lower leg. Um, and Achilles, if you know anything about him from these ancient Greek stories, just this unbelievable soldier, like he could not be hurt except for that was his one vulnerable spot the back of his heel. And so that's why we have it. That's why it's called the Achilles tendon today. Um, those guys accompanied a fleet of more than a thousand ships from throughout the Hellenic world. They crossed the Aegean Sea, which is there today, if you look at kind of that Greek area of the world, to Asia Minor, which is Asia Minor. It's an old term for like where Turkey is today to lay siege to Troy and demand Helen's return to Priam, the Trojan king. The siege, punctuated by battles and skirmishes, included the storied death of the Trojan prince Hector and the nearly invincible, nearly invincible, because he is invincible, like you can't hurt him except for that back part of his leg, uh, lasted more than 10 years until the morning the Greek armies retreated from their camp, leaving a large wooden horse outside the gates of Troy. After much debate and unheeded warnings by Priam's daughter Cassandra, the Trojans pulled the mysterious gift into the city. When night fell, the horse opened up and a group of Greek warriors, led by Odysseus, who becomes kind of our hero, our protagonist, although some people think he's a little bit of an antagonist too, um, climbed out and sacked the Troy from within. After the Trojan defeat, the Greek heroes slowly made their way home. Odysseus took 10 years, and that's what we're going to be reading about in, in the Odyssey, Odysseus' 10-year journey back home to make the arduous and often interrupted journey home to Ithaca recounted in the Odyssey. Helen, whose two successive Trojan husbands were killed during the war, returned to Sparta to reign with Menelaus. After his death, some sources say she was exiled to the island of Rhodes, where a vengeful war widow had her hanged. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So little is known about the historical Homer. Not many people know about him. He's the author of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, historians date the completion of the Iliad to about 750 BC and the Odyssey to about 725. So they're written kind of back to back by Homer. Both began with an oral tradition, like we said a lot of the, back then in, in ancient Greece, these stories were told more than they were written down. So an oral tradition and were first transcribed decades or centuries after their comp composition. Many of the most familiar episodes of the war from the abduction of Helen to the Trojan horse and the sack of Troy come from the so-called epic cycle. Um, in the first century BC, the Roman poet Virgil composed the Aeneid, which is another epic poem that kind of goes hand in hand about the Trojan War or was inspired by the Trojan War. All right, lastly, is the Trojan War a real war? Many portions of the Trojan War epics are difficult to read historically. Several of the main characters are direct offspring of Greek gods. Helen was fathered by Zeus, who was kind of the god of all gods, who disguised himself as a, as a swan and raped her mother, Leda, and much of the action is guided or interfered with by the various competing gods. For example, Paris sudden, supposedly won Helen's love after awarding the goddess Aphrodite the golden apple for her beauty. The judgment of Paris tells the story of how Paris was asked to select the most beautiful goddess between Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite, who are all gods, Greek goddesses, excuse me. Um, so they've started, like it says, your major excavations at the site of Troy in, in 1870 under the direct direction of German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann uh, revealed a small citadel mound and layers of debris 25 meters deep. Later studies have documented uh, more than 46 building phases grouped into nine bands representing the site's inhabitation from 3000 BC until its final abandonment in AD 1350. So they found some stuff there. 
um, it's just hard to prove that there was a war that happened. And if it did so, um, it, it was different than the Trojan War because the Trojan War, as it's told by Homer in the Iliad and then Odysseus to trip back, it involves a lot of like gods and goddesses. And as we know today, that those aren't those aren't like real. So, did a war happen there? Possibly. Um, did it happen the way that Homer uh, tells it? Nah, probably not. Hey, my son just woke up. Okay, back to the PowerPoint here. So how does the Odyssey fit in? Odysseus was one of the Spartan soldiers who fought on Menelaus' side, and the Trojan horse idea was his idea. So right away, there's some indirect characterization about Odysseus that we're going to talk about a lot. He's smart. He's tricky. He's savvy. Um, he comes up with this trick idea um, of how to finally defeat the Trojans. Because remember, they're outside of, of the city of Troy for almost 10 years, and they can't break in. So he comes up with the idea of the Trojan horse. Um, after the war, the Spartans felt victorious, and they boasted of how awesome they were. Again, we're going to talk about that and, and about how boastful they were, and Odysseus is throughout his story. Um, he's pretty uh, pretty proud of himself, a little bit arrogant. We're going to talk about how that fits into the story. Because of Odysseus's arrogance, meaning he was bragging about himself, and that gets him into trouble a little bit on his journey home, the gods decide to punish him a little bit and make his journey home difficult. Uh, they make his journey home twice as long and twice as difficult. The Long Road Home. That is why they call the story the Odyssey. It is an epic journey. We'll talk more about what that means. Uh, Odysseus's journey is prolonged by monsters, gods, goddesses, nature, shipwreck, um, and foolish men that are kind of thrown at him. Um, some of the gods and goddesses do try to help him out. Others try to make his journey miserable, and that, and they try to slow his his journey home. And we'll talk more once we start reading the story. What? Why does he want to get home so badly? Um, an epic poem. Epics are long narrative poems. We think of a poem as maybe a page long. Uh, this thing's like hundreds of pages long that tell the adventures of a hero. Um, Odysseus is considered an, an epic hero. We'll also talk about what does that mean? What, is it, what does it mean to be a hero? They are told to teach the virtues and values of a culture. And we do. We learn that about the, the virtues and values of Greek culture through Odysseus's story and his journey back home from the Battle of Troy. The Iliad and the Odyssey were told by Homer to teach about the culture of the Greeks. Characteristics of an epic poem, um, physically strong hero usually of national or historical importance, a vast setting covering a large portion of the world for a journey, which we'll see, a quest or journey in search of something of value, so either love, gold, a weapon, a map, something like that. Supernatural forces in, are involved. As we said, there are gods involved here and some kind of supernatural type of creatures that he runs into. And then the hero is glorified at the end. The theme of the Odyssey. The theme of the story is about finding one's proper place in life and learning humility. Humility being kind of the opposite of being arrogant. If you're if, if you're someone of humility, um, obviously someone that's arrogant is a little over proud of themselves. Uh, humility is the opposite. Someone who is more selfless. Uh, Odysseus never wanted to go to war in the first place. He didn't think it was a good idea to go to war over a cheating wife. Uh, when he returns from his adventures, his number one concern is his own wife. Um, has she cheated since he's been gone? When he leaves, as we'll see, he has a wife back at home um, and, and a young son as well. And he wants to get home to see them. And one of his concerns is that his wife may have cheated on him like this wife that he went to fight for cheated on King Menelaus. The religion. What we consider to be myth today was at one point someone's religion. 
Um, some people thought this as sort of a religion back in the day in ancient Greece. Each god or goddess played an important role in everyday life. So these gods and goddesses that we learn about in the Odyssey were actually gods and goddesses that the ancient Greeks believed in. Um, and they were very superstitious with some of the stuff with the gods and goddesses. Zeus was the god of the sky and the ruler of all the gods and goddesses. Uh, Athena, she's the goddess of wisdom. Um, she's also the goddess of war and weaving as well. Um, but in, in this epic poem, uh, they focus on her as being the goddess of wisdom. Poseidon is the god of the sea who is brutal and violent. Um, while reading the Odyssey, keep in mind the external and internal conflicts that Odysseus runs into. The external conflicts being obviously stuff from the outside, but also what's he battling internally uh, in his own head. He'll face many external conflicts because of the monsters and the gods. Um, it doesn't matter whether he fails or succeeds, the journey there and what is learned is what's most important. That's why they told these epic poems, uh, to kind of teach life lessons again. It's kind of like what we've been doing with the personal narrative, like what was the life lesson you learned from your story? His internal conflicts are about controlling his temper, his ego, uh, his urges. And here's just a picture of uh, Poseidon and him kind of wreaking havoc on a ship or ships, which he does with Odysseus. All right, that is my spiel. Um, you've got one assignment that you need to work on, and that is posted in the classwork. Um, I believe it is titled, um, uh, let me see here, the Trojan, what did I do with it? Here we go. It is titled Ancient Greece, the Trojan War. Um, it's a quick, basically a one page read, and then you need to answer some questions that go with it. And that will be due next time we meet, which in my book should be on Friday. So go ahead and get working on that. Um, stick on the Zoom until class is done. And uh, actually when you're done with that worksheet, if you finish it up, um, chat with me and tell me that you're done. So, and once you turn it on a Google Classroom, and then if I see that it's done and complete, I will chat you back and possibly dismiss you then from class. See ya.